there are very good biological reasons why this water is so turbid. To find out why, we have to investigate further. This is Hoverton Great Broad, and with me is Dr. Brian Moss of East Anglia University. Dr. Moss had made extensive studies of the history of the broads and the changes that are taking place in them nowadays. Now tell me, what's the importance of these studies that you're making? Well, perhaps you don't know, but these are not natural lakes, they're man-made lakes. They were dug out originally by the Danes from the 9th century, and since then they've been changing. In, in what way? Well, in the last 10 years they've been changing quite a lot from various forms of pollution. And we've got quite a lot of information on what happens nowadays, but since there were no scientists around 100, 200, 300 years ago, we don't know a great deal of what was going on then. So what we're doing is yeah. to uh, try and work out this past history and, and the past changes by looking at the record uh, in the sediment. Now, what's the importance of this long tube? It looks like a drain pipe. Uh, it's a water pipe. Ah. Uh, the importance is that we can use it to take a column or a core of sediment from underneath the water uh, in which is contained the history of this broad right back to, 14, to 1400. I see. It's very simple. It's just a water pipe sliced down the either side, taped together so we can get the mud out afterwards. I see. And all we do, well, let's do it, is to push it straight in uh, right down to the peat um, and pull it up again. It sounds easy, uh, but we'll see what happens. It what has a I sharp do? end. You just stay there, just for, stay the, there. Right. for the moment. Uh, the great thing is stability at the moment. I see. I'm glad you know what you're doing. It looks like I'm going to lose you at any moment. Right, I think that's probably as far as it will go. Oh, yes. No, no, we have the problem of getting it I out. Just, how on earth do you get it out again? Like this. Uh, this... If you can now start to move forward, as I move backwards, yeah. this is where we most, both may end up in the water. I see. And bash that bung in. Whoops. We pass one another, do we? <laughs> Yes. My golly, as it comes up. Right, can you get me? Just clear out a little bit in the bottom. Right, just a moment. Ugh. That really is dirty. Now, see if I can get this bung in. That's right. Just needn't go in very hard. It won't go at all. Just a second. Ah, OK, fine. That's it. Oh yes, that's very nice. That's a very nice core. Well, what's very nice about it? Well, it's it's got very nice layering. It's lovely, in fact, and it shows very clearly the the main features of history in this broad. Right. Well, will you take me through it from the bottom up? Right. Well, this brown layer is the original peat. Uh, when this valley was first flooded, twelve thousand years ago, it became colonised by the sort of swampland, tree swampland that you see quite a lot of around you still. You can see, in fact, a bit of tree here. That's a bit of old birch tree. And then all the rest of it is the remains of reed and, and other swamp plants. Do you know how we can tell this is a completely organic soil? No, how? Eat it. <laughs> if it's not gritty on your teeth, then it's totally organic. If it's gritty on your teeth, it's got mineral matter in it, and that's what causes the grinding. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> right. OK, so that was the original peat dug out, uh, or the deposits which the Danes started to dig out between the 9th century and about 1400. Yeah. Then the weather got wetter and the peat pits were flooded. So from then onwards, that's about 1400, uh, this was a lake. And all of these sediments are sediments laid down underwater. Well, the first 
lot of sediments, these grey ones, uh, as you can see, are well populated by snails. There yeah. It's a nice, a very nice preserved snail there. That's the original Broads Lake. Would have had lovely clear water uh, and these nice water weeds. Then, about here, you can see it starts getting darker. Yeah, very much darker. We're here about 1800, 1850. Yeah. Much blacker sediment, but it's still got the snails. They're very abundant in it. If you put your finger through it, you'll find it's quite gritty. Oh, yes, it is, yeah. And okay. you can still see the snails there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But then we get to the top of this black layer, somewhere around here. Yeah. When suddenly the snails disappear. In fact, they disappear about there. And above that, we just have this uniform uh, sediment. No snail remains at all. Just mud. Just mud. The snails disappeared altogether. And when did that happen? Well, we think about 1947 to 1950 in this As recently as that? Oh, yes. So that, all that sediment from there to there is sediment deposited in the broad from the plankton and washed in from the river between 1950 and 1980. That's 30 years. From there to there is about 1950 to 1850, 100 years. And from there to there, is 1850 to, to 1400, 450 years. So you can see how much the rate of sedimentation has increased. The broads are now filling in uh, at the rate of about a centimetre, a centimetre and a half a year. So what's happened during the last 30 years? What's gone wrong? Well, first of all, there's been an enormous increase in population. The city of Norwich has grown a great deal. All the small towns have grown. Uh, and secondly, there's been an enormous increase in the tourist population. Uh, all of them uh, increase the total population in the summer by a factor of about three. Uh, and of course all of them are producing sewage which eventually goes to the sewage works and comes out at the other end as effluent and is discharged into the waters. Now why is that an important factor? Well, sewage effluent uh, is a wonderful solution for fertilising plants. It contains vast amounts more phosphate uh, than the water that drains off the land, for example. Uh -huh. uh, something like 10,000 times as much. The phosphate comes from two sources. First of all, from the food people eat. Uh, it's ultimately plant food and that contains phosphate. But also, nowadays, from phosphate detergents. Now, is this phosphate in the sewage the only cause? No, there's another one too, and that's nitrate. Uh, nitrate comes off the land from farming practice, and nitrate comes off particularly in this area because the farming is so intensive. And it's come off much more since the 1950s. Uh, so it's these two factors together, phosphate and nitrate, uh, which have caused the problem because phosphate and nitrate together are a very powerful mixture in biological terms. So this mixture isn't poisonous? By no means. It, it's, it's a very good fertilizer. But the problem is it fertilizes the wrong things. It doesn't, after, after, after the start, fertilize the bottom plants, the big plants. It fertilizes the microscopic plants, which we call the, the plankton, which are suspended in the water. If we take your two samples you took in the two broads back to my laboratory, then I can show you uh, exactly what effect this fertilizer has on the plankton. Here are the two samples that I've sedimented down from your two, two lots of water. Um, let's look first of all at the one from the Clear Lake. Right. If you look at this, uh, the main thing you see is virtually nothing. That's right, it's very clear. Uh, just a few very small cells, um, no phytoplankton, none of the plant plankton at all in that. Yeah. But if we compare it with this other sample yeah. from your turbid water, then I think we will see an entirely different appearance. Here, ah, there we are. Oh, you can yes. see many, many more. Uh, the sort of population numbers uh, in this sample will be of around 100,000 per milliliter. Um, that's 100 million per liter. Oh, I couldn't think in terms that big. Well, well, the population of Europe in one milk bottle um, <laughs> would be about right. Because there's so many of them, uh, they absorb a great deal of the light. Water absorbs a lot of light anyway, yeah. on its own. But if you put in this sort of number of, of small cells, 
then they absorb the lot. And the result is, even if you've only got one meter of water, mm -hmm. uh, right at the bottom there's virtually no light, in fact no light at all for much of the year. Ah, which means that nothing can grow on the bottom. So that's why there are no plants under the water here, as in so many of the broads. The plankton, fertilized by the phosphate and nitrate, have taken over. And just look what's happening to the reed beds, which used to line the broads from end to end. It's thought that the underwater plants used to slow down the waves caused by the wind, so protecting the reeds. And the reeds, in turn, used to protect the banks from water currents, which tend to wash them away. Without the reeds, the banks are crumbling. This is happening in the rivers as well as the lakes. And as if the natural currents of water aren't enough, there's an additional effect which greatly increases the damage. There are now 6,500 pleasure boats on the Norfolk Roads, most of them in use during the summer months. And if the banks are washed away, what then? Since the farmland in this area is generally lower than the level of the waterways, there's a very great danger of flooding throughout the entire area. In fact, the engineers have been forced to provide protection from flooding. They line the banks with steel shuttering and then face the top with great wooden box. In theory, every river and lake in the Broads area could be lined in this way. But the cost is very high, running into as much as three figures for just one meter. And anyway, do we want the Norfolk Broads lined with steel? Is that what we come here to admire? And even more important than that, artificial shuttering is no habitat for wildlife. It's the reed beds which provide, or used to provide, the habitat for the kinds of creatures which are now coming under pressure. 30 years ago, 60 pairs of bittern were counted on the Broads, and that's not very many. In 1980, only three breeding pairs were found. The otter used to be a common sight, but you'd be lucky if you spotted one today. Other species in danger are the swallowtail butterfly and the marsh harrier. All of them are searching for homes in an increasingly hostile environment. Fish, too, are finding it hard to survive without the plants that used to provide their spawning habitats and hunting grounds. Back in the 19th century, fishermen used to report huge catches, which would leave today's anglers green with envy. Even the holiday makers afloat are finding it more difficult to keep moving. The water plants used to anchor the silt in the riverbeds. Now it moves downstream to fill up the broads. In some places, channels can only be kept open by dredging. In short, everyone is feeling the pinch. And if it goes on like this much longer, there won't be suitable water left for fish, flesh, nor fowl. Of course, the engineers must apply their solutions where it's necessary. But is there no way we can restore the ecological balance over the broads as a whole? Can't we bring back the underwater plants and the reeds? Not just to protect the banks, but to provide a habitat for the wild creatures as well. Dr. Moss and other biologists believe there is a way. The great problem uh, is to get rid of the plankton. And the way you do this is by stopping it growing by cutting down its supply of nutrients. Yeah. Two main nutrients, nitrate and phosphate. Yeah. You can't do a great deal about nitrate, but you can do something about the phosphate by damming off areas of water from the river, which carries the phosphate rich sewage effluent. Oh, like this here? That's exactly so. This is but... an experiment which does just that. Well, let's have a look at it. This bit of shuttering here, Fergus, uh, it's really just a simple bit of corrugated iron hammered into, into the bottom, it forms a dam which keeps out the phosphate rich river water from getting into the dike, which is the ditch mm. uh, behind it. Yeah. Uh, in the ditch water now, we've got lots of nitrate because the water's coming off the land surface, but very little phosphate. And you can see what's happening. We put this dam in, I think in May, uh, two years ago, and that same summer, we got the first aquatic plants coming back. Uh, the water cleared quite rapidly, and the plants started to recolonize. So it's really quite a successful experiment, which shows what is practical. But we can't dam up all the lakes and cut off all the dikes. The drainage system would break down. So in order to achieve this effect over the broads as a whole, we have to cut off the supply of phosphate much nearer to its source, before it reaches the water. This is Stalham Sewage Works, one of the most recent to be built to accommodate the increasing population of this area. There are 15 other sewage works, some of them much bigger than this, 
discharging effluent into the broads. That means that all of them are discharging soluble phosphate too, except this one at Stalham, because here there's another biological experiment being carried out. Ferric sulfate is the agent chosen to remove the soluble phosphate from the effluent passing through this plant. Measured quantities of the sulfate solution are carefully monitored and then pumped into the system. This is the mixing chamber. Now, the ferric sulfate is pumped through this pipe and into the treated effluent. By the time the sewage gets this far, just about everything has been removed except the soluble phosphate. Now, when ferric sulfate and soluble phosphate are mixed, they coagulate and bind together into solid particles. These solid particles are then removed in the settlement tanks. When the effluent is discharged through this outflow into the River Ant and so on into the Barton Broad, over 90% of the phosphate has been removed. If this experiment proves to be successful, and the biologists have no reason to believe that it won't be, the effect here in Barton Broad will soon be seen. But if all the broads are to be cleared of plankton, it means we have to go a lot further with phosphate stripping, as it's called. The question is, are we prepared to do it? Some solution is needed urgently, or the broads will deteriorate still further and faster. The engineers have an immediate answer, but it's not a complete one. Brian Moss again. As a biologist, I think the biological solution is obviously the best one. Uh, it's treating the cause rather than just treating the symptoms. And it would not only solve some of the economic, the practical problems, it would also create a much better environment uh, for the broads. But the problem is not everybody's a biologist. Other people have their points of view. The holiday industry has its point of view. The engineers have theirs. And our problem is to try and convince these other people that our biological solution is by far the best one.